Welcome everyone. This class has been brought to you by Be There Israel, live streamed, and Or Chadash. Uh, welcome to everyone. Tell your friends. And in a few days it will be uh, archived and then everyone can see it whether you're tuned in right now or not. Uh, one of our regular uh, students uh, can't be here tonight, but she sent me an email asking us to um, dedicate the learning to a young girl, five years old, who is fighting leukemia. Her name is Shachar Bat Gitit. Shachar Bat Gitit, she have a for Shalema. All of the learning that we're doing tonight should be a, a shmira guarding for her, her soul. Mm -hmm. And she should find a refuah very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, tonight we're learning Parsha Bayetse. And we have some truly amazing concepts tonight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing concepts. Uh, it's something that I've been fascinated in for years. And I've included different parts in uh, my, my various books. Um, but in the last few weeks, I've learned even more new angles to this. So it keeps on growing and we'll do our best to understand it. We're going to spend almost the whole class discussing the dream of Yaakov. But uh, for anyone who's read my book on dreams. Mm -hmm. So this was the inspiration for the whole book, was this dream. Mm -hmm. And so the whole second half of the book is about this dream. And the first part is laying the foundations of the, the general ideas of dreams in Torah and Kabbalah, modern psychology, how they all mesh together, and then applying it to this dream. But tonight we want to take a very a very, very specific idea within the text of the dream. And through that, we'll touch on many, many different parts of the dream. But we're going to really focus on one particular word. For those who've been following these classes, we've been picking a theme that runs through the Parsha. Sometimes the theme is an idea, and sometimes it's a word. So tonight it's a word, and the word is makom, place. And we're going to see the, the importance in this whole story of the dream of Yaakov, but even more so, uh, I'll, I'll proceed this with, with, with an idea that what's called Ruach HaKodesh, uh, divine inspiration. One of the uh, principles of divine inspiration is that the person through whom the inspiration is coming through doesn't always know the total um, uh, significance or, or manifestation of these teachings. They're, they're a channel. And they, they obviously, they're, they're in a certain way, connected to what's coming through them. But uh, if anyone's had a creative experience where a song or a picture or a poem just, it just flows through, and you feel almost like you're automatic writing, just trying to catch it. That's what Reb Shlomo said about his. His, his songs, when asked, well, how many songs have you made up? He said, I haven't made up any songs. I just try to catch them when they're coming down. So, some of the things that we're going to say tonight, it's it's like embedded in the text. That's why the, the Torah is, is, is infinite, it's holy, it's prophetic. Because in every generation, we see new things in the text. So we're going to see that, that 
and it will take a while to develop. Everyone has to be patient. But there are many, many phenomenal ideas that are connected to uh, quantum physics and modern cosmology that are hinted to in, in particularly this word makom and how it's used. Makom means place, space, and how it's used in the story. So, so first let's establish in the context of what's happening here. The first verse in, in the Parsha, for those who are following, 28.10, Perakhavchet, Pasuk Yud, says, V'yetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva, V'yelech Harana. Yaakov went out from Be'er Sheva, and he went towards Haran. What's happening here? The end of the last Parsha, after Yaakov takes, receives the blessing from Yitzhak. So Asa wants to kill him. And secondly, Rivka speaks to Yitzhak and says, if, if Yaakov marries like Asa did, then like, what is my life worth? So Yitzhak and Rivka send Yaakov away to her family, to Rivka's family, to find a wife. So in other words, there's two reasons why he's leaving. One is because Asa wants to kill him. And second, for the second reason that it's time for him to get married. So that's how the Parsha begins. And then it says he comes upon the first appearance. He comes to the place. And he lies down there and he has a dream of a ladder that is firmly entrenched in the earth and its head reaches the heavens and there are angels going up and coming down and God appears at above him or at the top of the ladder and gives him all kinds of assurances and really is conferring upon him God's uh, agreement that he's the third of the patriarchs and that the land that he's lying on will be given to him and his children forever and God will protect him and bring him back to the land. And Yaakov wakes up and says, Man makom How awesome is this place? That God was here and I didn't know it. So Rashi says, if I would have known it, I never would have gone to sleep. And then uh, Yaakov anoints the stone or stones, maybe we'll get to explain that, that he rested his head on. And he said, this is the gate to heaven. And then he makes a promise to God, and then he goes on his way. This is, there are ten dreams in the Chumash. Exactly ten dreams. And the interesting thing is, is eight of them, occur during the month of Kislev. In the next month, we just had, had the new moon of, of Kislev, Rosh Chodesh Kislev, eight of the ten. I'm pretty sure it's eight, it could be seven. Seven or eight of them occur in this month. You know, it's interesting in Sefer Yitzira, probably the oldest Kabbalistic text that we have, each month has a sense attached to it. The five physical senses that we usually think of and another seven. The sense of this month is sleep. So everyone asks, well, what, what kind of sense is sleep? Well, first of all, 
we shouldn't take sleep for granted because many people have insomnia and wish they had a sense of sleeping. But really what it means is a sense of dreaming. This month is very, very connected to dreams. And so then it turns out that in the Chumash, so this is the, the first of, of the dreams that are coming up in the next month. Okay, so this is just a context of what's happening here. So let's establish immediately like what we want to do here with this word makom. The word makom appears exactly six times in the story. And it's really only um, uh, maybe ten verses. The dream, yeah, the, the actual part, six times Makom appears in a very short amount of, of space. So, the first time it says that he came to the place. And he slept there because the sun had set. And he took the stones of the place. And he put them around his head, and he slept in that place. Three times in one sense. Three times in one sense. So Rashi, Rashi wants to, well, first of all, why don't they name it? Why is it called Hamakom, the place? And why does it have to say he put the stones of the place? It could have said he took the stones and put it around his head. So, first of all, makom again means space. How many sides or directions does space have? Six. Six. Right, the four cardinal directions and above and below. This we know very well from shaking lulav. Because part of the idea of shaking lulav is to be very, very aware that God is all around us. So anytime we think of space, even though you have circular spaces, triangular spaces, but in general, when we think of space, we're thinking of really a cube, a six-sided cube. So already, it's not a coincidence that this word makom appears six times in this story. Because makom means space, place. So already it's hinting that beyond whatever we'll learn about this word and its appearance in the story, it's alluding to something more that we can learn about space. So when, so when Yaakov wakes up, so the first thing he says is, so first he says in Pasuk Tet Zion 16, he says, Vayikatz Yaakov Mishenato, so he, Yaakov, woke up startled from his sleep and he said, Thus God was in this place, and I didn't know. And he was very filled with awe. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate to heaven. Now, according to tradition, what is this place? Rashi tells us. But we're going to see it's not so simple. Rashi says the fact that it's called Hamakom 
over and over. It says, hints to another time that the word hamakom is used. When is that? When Avram is taking Yitzhak to the Akedah. And it says that he saw the place from afar. Because God said, go to the place that I will show you. So he saw Hamakom from afar. And according to tradition, this was the Temple Mount. So according to tradition, where is Yaakov laying down to sleep? On the Temple Mount. Now we're going to build on this because it's not so simple. Everything it gets very complicated. But in the simple understanding, Rosh said, this is Jewish Shalim. So when he says, this is the house of God, and this is the gate to heaven, he is, in a sense, prophesying that this was where the temple will be built, and this is where all prayers ascend to heaven. And that is our tradition. That's why we always face Yerushalayim, no matter where we are in the world, and what we're told, let's say my left hand is um, Seattle. My right hand is Melbourne. So we're told if, if someone's davening in these two places, the prayers don't go up. They go to Yerushalayim, to the Beit HaMikdash, and then they go up. So this is one of the reasons why so many people have a powerful experience at the at the Kotel, at the Western Wall. Because what's happening 24 hours a day, prayers are being, are being funneled through there, are being channeled. If someone could like open their eyes and, and be aware of, of all the dimensions and the energy patterns, well, prayers are flowing through there. So when people get have an emotional experience at the Kotel, part of it is, is just, it's, like, it's what's called an energy vortex. Mm -hmm. It's a vortex of energy. And what is it, according to Yaakov? It's the gate to heaven. So, this, so Rashi tells us it's Yerushalayim. It's the Beit to Mikdash. So now we're going to start seeing some very interesting things. And I can, I can only add them one at a time. I, I could present this in, in like 50 different ways. So it's going to come out the way it comes out. But we're going to like build and see what, what is happening with the space. So let's first understand what Yaakov says. We already said what Rashi said. And he said that God was in this place and I didn't know. So we can understand that on many different levels. And one level was he just had this dream and God appears to him in the dream. And it's very clear to him that this, is, this, is, this dream is a message from God. And so when he woke up, it was like, God was here. God was here, and I, I didn't know it. So in other words, he understood that God's appearance wasn't just in his dream. Mm -hmm. There was something about the place itself that God was there beforehand. Mm -hmm. Because he said, I, I wouldn't have gone to sleep if I would have known that God was there. But on a deeper level, we can understand it like this. Yaakov, this is going back to last week. We're told that Yaakov sat in the tents of Torah. Yaakov was the spiritual one. Asaph was the physical one. And uh, Yitzchak thought, well, we'll just divide the world. Asaph will take care of the physical. Yaakov, the, uh, the spiritual, they'll work together. But as we learned last week, Rivka saw it that this was not workable, it, it just was not going to be. And that real tikkun, real rectification, is that every person has to be able to 
integrate physical and spiritual. You can't divide the world like that. Mm -hmm. The real goal is to unify spiritual and physical. This is the secret of the Mug and David, where you have one triangle going up and one diametrically opposed going down, mm -hmm. but they're interlinked. Mm -hmm. And that represents all dualities in the world. And that's also hinted to in the angels going up and coming down. And that the latter being connected to the earth and to the heavens. That this was, this is what Yaakov was dreaming about because this was becoming his mission in life. When he was sent away, he understood that it was now time to integrate the physical and the spiritual. So on a deeper level, we can understand when Yaakov says that God was in this place and I didn't know it as a realization that God is in the physical as well. I've been dwelling in the tents of Torah my whole life. I, this is the first time Yaakov is going out into the world. Mm -hmm. And he understands from what just happened with, with Yitzhak and the bracha and his mother insisting that he gets it. And now he has to go get married. Not that he has to get married, but it's time for him to get married. According to tradition, when he leaves, he was 63 years old and he still wasn't married. Mm -hmm. And he married it at age 77. <clears throat> no, excuse me. He met Rachel at 77. He was right. married at 84. Yeah, <laughs> so Yaakov is aware that his life is changing. And here he has a realization that God is also in the physical. Now, this is very, very connected to a realization of his grandfather, Avram. Because a few parshas ago, it says that Avram built an altar and he called it Kale Olam. Kale, one of the names of God. Olam. So Rav Ginsburg teaches that if he meant to say God is the is the master of the world or God is in charge of the world, it would have said Kale Ha Olam, mm -hmm. the God of the world, God of the world. But it doesn't. It says, Kael Olam. So he said what Avram was realizing was that it wasn't that God is up there someplace, but God is everywhere. Everywhere. And that space and time are filled with God. That everything... So that's, what, that's why it says Kael Olam and not Kael Ha Olam. Mm -hmm. So now Yaakov is, comes to the same realization. That God was in this place and I didn't know it. So again, we could take it on, on different levels, but w w one of the ways we can take it is he was now realizing that God is in space. Now let's look at that a little bit deeper. So we're going to see this from a few different angles. The first one is, why did God, why did Avram, if, if, if he meant to say that the God is the world and the world is God, so he's, he's not saying it in a pantheistic way. Pantheism says almost the same thing. God is the world and the world is God. But what they mean by it is the sum total 
of the physical universe, that is God. That's not what Avram meant. That's not what Avram meant. God is so, like so much more than the sum total of the physical world. But that everything in the world is also animated by God. Nothing can exist without a spark of God. That's what the Ari taught. Even a stone. A stone also, according to the Ari, also has a level of soul. Because it has a spark of God in it. It's not the same spark that's in a plant, or in an animal, or in a human. They're all different levels. So here's the first, we'll call it um, Kabbalistic hint here. That Avram says specifically, Kale Olam, the numerical value of this name of God in Aleph and Alamed is 31. The world is space. And we already established there's six sides to space. So what is six times 31? 186. 186. Which equals makom. The word for space is 186 equals six times this name of God. But now let's see even closer to what Yaakov was saying. See, there, Avram used the word kale. Here, Yaakov says the name yud ke vav ke was in this place. So if you take, this is a, uh, an accepted uh, device in, 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 in gematria, numerical Mm -hmm. uh, ideas to try to get a deeper understanding. If you take the four, letter, four letters of God's name and you multiply them by themselves. So in other words, Yud times Yud. He times He. A Vav times Vav and a He times He. So Yud is 10. 10 times 10 is 100. Mm -hmm. He is 5. 5 times 5 is 25. Vav mm -hmm. is 6. 6 times 6 is 36. He is, is 5. 5 times 5 is 25. Add them together. 186. Makom. Now, someone could be thinking, oh, come on. <laughs> like, like, like that's, that's cute. But what's amazing is we have not that many, there's a number, we have what are called kinuim, um, names that we use to refer to God. The most famous is Hashem. Mm -hmm. When we say Hashem, we mean God, but we don't say God, and we don't, and we don't use the name in Hebrew. We say the name, Hashem. One of them is Makom. One of God's names is Makom. Where, where do we use this? The, the place that it's, it's most recognized, we should never know. But when you go to a house of mourning mm -hmm. and you want to comfort the mourners, so you say, HaMakom Yenachem Atchem Betok Shar Av Leitzion Yerushalayim. Hamakom, meaning God. God should comfort you among the, the mourners of Zion and Yerushalayim. And God is called Hamakom. Hamakom Yenachem Etchem. So when we did this, Yud times Yud and Hey, like, it's not far fetched. It's not far fetched because they make. <laughs> They go as far as to use this word as a name of God, Makom. So this is already alerting us that there's like deeper things going on here. But we'll see it gets much deeper. Much, much deeper.
Okay, so let's go to the sentence where God says to, oh, and I should point out now that in Pasuk Yud Tet, it says, Vayikra et Shem HaMakom, and ya, this is after the dream, after God has spoken to him, and, he, and, he, and Yaakov meaning, and he called the name of the place, Havu, Beit El, the house of God. This name that we just established is 31 times 6 is Makom. And this is the name that Avram used in his realization that all of space is filled with God. So I just wanted to point that out, that he names it Beit El. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, going back to one of the promises that God makes to him, Let's go to Pasuk Yud Gimel. So it says like this. I'll just read it in English. And behold, God appeared to him above him. And he said, I am God, the God of Avram, your father, the God of Yitzhak. The land that you are lying on I will give to you and to your children. So, the obvious implication is, just like I promised Avram all of Eretz Yisrael, and I promised Yitzhak all of Eretz Yisrael, I'm now promising you all of Eretz Yisrael. But when you look at the words very literally, very literally, and, and Rashi comments on this, it says, the land that you are lying on. Meaning, the land that you're lying on and nothing else. He, because he, he, God didn't say, all, I'm giving you all of the land of Israel. He says, I'm giving you the land that you're lying on. So Rashi comments, on like, like, how do we understand that? So he brings an amazing um, explanation. From the Gemara, from Chulan. And he says, Kipel HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kol Eretz Yisrael Tachtav. That God fold, literally folded up all of Eretz Yisrael underneath him. Why? He says, to tell him that just like it would not be difficult to conquer these Dalit Amot, these four cubits, so you will be able to conquer the whole land. But what I'm interested in here is this concept that God folded up all of Eretz Yisrael underneath him. And we're, going to want, we want to under, we're going to try to understand this on a much deeper level. But before we do that, we're going to see there are a couple of other very, very interesting things that happen with space here. Now, I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. But we said the tradition is, where was he? he the place? The Beit HaMikdash, the future temple. But when he names it Beit El, so it says that first, that the name of the city first was Luz. Right. So all of a sudden, it's, wait a minute, I thought this was Yerushalayim. Mm -hmm. Luz is a different place. Mm -hmm. According to tradition, it's close to Yerushalayim, but it's not the same place. So what's going on here? So Rashi, in a long Rashi, brings a number of different opinions. One opinion is, remember the very first verse was Yaakov went out from Beersheba mm -hmm. to go to Haran. Mm -hmm. So according to one opinion, he had the, he, the, the, the foot of the ladder was in Beersheba. 
The head of the ladder was in Beit El, and the middle of the ladder was it, it was in Yerushalayim. Because was it Yerushalayim or was it Beit El? So this answer is like, well, it was both of them. Then Rashi brings another opinion that the place Yerushalayim jumped to Beit El. It jumped to Beit El. And then he brings another opinion, which is just the opposite, that the, the Beit HaMikdash jumped towards Yaakov. When, he was come, when it was time for him to go to sleep, it jumped towards him. So you're like, what's the like, Okay, it's a, it, these are, you know, what is called agarata. They're symbolic. But this is what I started this year with, that sometimes there are secrets in the Torah that, that are revealed hundreds or thousands of years later. They're hinting to things. And Rashi, as we're going to see, there's one more word and then we're going to put together. Right in the beginning, so just before we read it, so we see that like, like, folds up all of Eretz Yisrael under him. The, the earth is jumping, coming to greet Yaakov. And then, something I didn't mention also, is, and again, you have to be patient because I'm going to put this all together. It says in the second verse that we read already, that he came upon the place and he slept there because the sun had set. So Rashi says, the sun set before its time, so that he would sleep in this place. So now you have time jumping also. And we know that in a dream, so I'm gonna mention Einstein now, but we're gonna mention him a few more times. Einstein revealed what was what's called the elasticity of time or the shrinking of time. Because time is dependent on, on, on velocity and gravity and in relationship to um, bodies in motion. So there so you have what's called the elasticity of time, where time can be can expand and time can shrink. So that when we get towards the speed of light, time slows down. And when you get to the speed of light, time stops altogether. Which is one of the most mystical notions you can imagine, but it's the most pure science that all modern physics is based on this. So here we see there's something going on here with time and with space. And then one last thing, the, the, the central idea here is, is this dream of Yaakov. Now in dreams we know that we could be asleep for 10 minutes and we have a dream that seems like it's forever. Mm -hmm. Forever. And they can even, now they can even map the brain waves and they know exactly when you're in deep sleep and when you're dreaming. And they, can, and they, and they know that uh, we dream up to seven dreams a night. And most dreams are very short on the, mm -hmm. on the clock. But when you're experiencing that dream, it's <clears> like <throat> you could go on and on and on and on and on and on. you wish you could do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually when you sleep for 10 minutes, it seems like the longest yeah, dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> all of this is happening. Okay, so one more piece of the puzzle, we'll call it, is 
is something that Rashi says in the beginning. When he says, and Yaakov went out of Beersheba. So Rashi asks, why does it say he went out? It could have said he went, he left. Mm -hmm. He traveled. Which is what you would expect. He went, he's starting a journey. So, Vayelech. He went on a journey. But it says he went out. So what does Rashi learn from this? So Rashi says like this. Says when a this is telling us that when a tzaddik goes out from a place, it leaves a impression, a roshan. And he continues, he says, all the time that the tzaddik is in the city, he is its glory, its light, and its um, beauty. He leaves from there, the glory leaves, the light leaves, and the beauty leaves. The chain takes a min hamakom. Thus, he went out from the place. Okay, so someone could read this Rashi and take it exactly for what it is. But I want to propose the following. I want to propose the following. That some of you maybe have heard this in, in simplified form, and that's how we'll give it over. But the Arizal developed an entire cosmology which people have been commenting for the last uh, 25, 30 years, which is startling like uh, modern cosmology, especially the Big Bang. So how does the Ari explain it? He says like this, and when God wanted to create the world, again, this is sim like simplified. So there was nothing but the infinite light of God. There's no time, there's no space. All there is is the infinite light of God. And now God, for reasons that we won't discuss here, decides he's gonna create the world. So the Ari says, God has, as it were, a problem. Because where do you put finite reality if all there is is infinite light? Where, where does it go? It's like an oxymoron. It, from the perspective of infinite, the idea of finite is an oxymoron. So the Ari explains what's called the tzimtzum, that, and it's far more complicated than what I'm saying now. But God contracted his being and created what's called halal apanui, an empty space. Sometimes it's called a vacuum. But listen carefully, this is the word that Rashi uses. That's why, this is what I caught this year that I hadn't totally connected here. He says, but it, it wasn't a perfect vacuum because there was what was called a rishimu, an impression of the infinite light remained. And the Ari, the Ari explains why that is and how it worked and all the reasons and the, and the implications and, and the, the effects, so that we're not going to explain. So again, this is what, what Rashi says here. I'll read the words again. He says, Elamagi min 
Om Oseh Roshan. That when the tzaddik leaves a place, it makes an impression. An impression is left. So this is the first year that I picked up on, whoa, like in relationship to everything that we're learning about Makom here. So here, Rashi is actually, whether he knew it or not, whether he understood the implication of his words or not, he's giving the formula here, because who is the tzaddik? Hashem. And when a tzaddik leaves a place, it leaves an impression. It leaves an impression. So the the Mittler Rebbe in uh, Shari Yichud gives nine different parables of how to understand the Tzimtzum and the Rishimo, meaning the contraction which allows their there to be space, and I didn't say I didn't finish that in this vacuum that does have a, an impression. Then God shown a a what's called the kav, a line of light into the middle of the halal of the vacuum, and from this all worlds were created. And this is really, it's just a different way of, of talking about the Big Bang. This whole cosmology is just a different way of explaining the Big Bang. So that's what Ramban says. Ramban says, when it says Bereshi, in the beginning, so, so he, he had like, what, what actually was created in the beginning? So he says, time and space. Time and space. Because before that, there was no time and there was no space. As soon as you have a beginning, then time grabs hold and space expands. And that is the, the Big Bang is really the Kav, it's this line. Now if you look at the word Makom, so it's Mem, Kuf, Bav, Mem. It begins with a Mem and ends with a Mem. But in the middle is the word Kav, the line. This line that came into the space. And the mem itself means makom in 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 uh, grammar. Um, like to sleep, like it says, vayilen vayalen sham. He went to sleep. So uh, the place where one goes to sleep, they call they call it a malom. The mem means a place where people sleep. Mm -hmm. What is the temple called? Beit HaMikdash. Mikdash is a place of holiness. Mm -hmm. When you put the mem before certain words, its simple meaning is place, mm -hmm. where, certain, where certain verbs happen. Mm -hmm. So here, the word makom in the middle is this kav, because that is, was the beginning of space. That was the beginning of all space. So now let's go back to the implication of this Gomorrah. This is a Gomorrah from 2,000 years ago. But other than people treating it like 
that's like, that's cute. This idea that God folded up all of Eretz Israel under Yaakov. Well, how do we explain the the point from which the Big Bang comes? That all future matter. In other words, how did they? I think we've mentioned this already. How did they f figure out the Big Bang? When Hubble in the twenties established that the universe is expanding. To which Einstein, see Einstein, with all of his brilliance, and even though his own equations told him that the universe is expanding, he didn't believe it. He, and so he added, he fudged his own equations to establish a static universe. And when Hubble discovered that the world is expanding, and Einstein realized that it was true, he said, this was the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. Mm -hmm. And then he took away the fudged <laughs> equations um, so when they realized that the space is expanding uh, simultaneously in all, all directions, we'll call them the six directions, at a same uh, velocity, and then they were able to map out increases in, in velocity and they just went backwards. So in other words, if, let's say the whole universe is this big, and then, well, so let's say 100 years ago is this big, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, a million years ago is this big, and a billion years ago is this big, until to a point. This is the ultimate folding up of the universe. Mm -hmm. This is the ultimate folding up of the universe. Now we haven't, remember this is happening in the, in, in the temple. So we're told in Pirkei Avo, Pirkei Avo is not a mystical treatise, but we're told there were 10 miracle, ongoing miracles in the temple. There are many more miracles, but there are 10 ongoing miracles. <coughs> One of them was, and the example they use is that on Yom Kippur, the temple was, it was crunched. Everyone was standing shoulder to shoulder, body to body. There was no room to move. Mm -hmm. It was so crowded. And then when the high priest would say the ineffable name of God that they used to pronounce, people were so filled with awe that everyone bowed down, which we still do on Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. So the question is, where was their space? He said, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. There was no space available. And yet, when, it, when the need was there, everyone could bow down. All of a sudden, there was space. The other thing it says about the Beit HaMikdash is that the, the Aron, the... Um, the ark took up no space. Mm -hmm. How did they figure that? And they, they had the measurements of how big the Holy of Holy was. They had the measurements of how, um, how long the, the wingspan of the crew were. Mm -hmm. And when they worked out simple math, it didn't work out. There was there was, <laughs> there, the, the, it wasn't enough space for the ark to fit in. And so the answer is, the Holy of Holies was beyond our concept of space.
Now, when you get into quantum physics and physics, you have this idea of, of how time and space can leap and can warp and can, and can tear and can fold. These are words of modern physics. So, again, someone will say to me, you're reading all of this into it. And the, and the answer is, I am. But it's here. <laughs> it's here. It's here. And it, like I said, that, that the, the general principle is that the farther we get away from Sinai, it means the closer we're getting to Mashiach. And the closer we're getting to Mashiach, the more that the secrets of the Torah are revealed. This is a general principle that why in every few generations you have uh, new insight, especially in the last 500 years where you had, uh, in the last thousand years, you had the revelation of the Zohar and then the revelations of the Arizal, mm -hmm. and then the revelations of the Baal Shem Tov. And each one expands on what comes before it. More and more is revealed. And this is the general principle of why the teachings of, of Kabbalah are spreading the way they are, because the closer we get to Mashiach, this, according to the Zohar, this is part and parcel of Mashiach coming, that these secrets should be revealed. Okay, so, I, before I went off on a tangent, I mentioned that the Mittler Rebbe gave nine parables of the tzimtzum, the contraction, and the impression that's left in the contraction in, in ways that we can understand in our own lives. In other words, the, the, all the teachings of, of Hasidut are whatever the notion is or concept, no matter how uh, ethereal or uh, paradoxical or Kabbalistic it may seem, it can all be explained in a way that a person in their own experience can understand it. So one of the ideas that is brought relates to the very first sentence. The Yaakov went out from Beersheba and he went towards Haran. So the parable here is that just like God, as it were, contracted his infinite light, in or, and again, this is a simplified version, in order to make space for the world, and but an impression is left, so it's explained that the soul, the manifestation of the soul in the body is only a very, very small part of the root of the soul. That the, in this world, so we, we use the, the uh, metaphor of an iceberg. An iceberg has a little tip sticking out of the water and if you have the right maps or you're a good, <laughs> you're a good captain, you understand that 99% that what you're seeing is just the tip of, that's the expression, the tip of the iceberg. You have this huge mass of ice underneath it. When we talk about the soul, the, the uh, metaphor is reversed. Because here, what's revealed in the soul and the body, 
below is only the tip of the root of the soul that remains above. The greater a sadi, or a, the greater a person, the, the more a person is able to access their own potential, then the more of that soul they can manifest in the body. That's why certain people are, are powerful because they are, there's more, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's, it's not for the good. But they have a certain power to manifest more of their soul powers in the body. And especially at Sadiq. At Sadiq is the, say, the charisma of a Sadiq is because people can feel the light of the soul, the divine light shining through this person. So the Midla Rebbe explains that the contraction is just, after the soul and the body is, is a contraction, it's a symptom of the larger soul. But there's an impression with, within the neshama of the of the bigger root soul. Like for example, we say on Shabbos we get an extra soul on Shabbos. Mm -hmm. So the question is, well, where does that soul come from? Does it magically just kind of float down from heaven into someone yeah. like a minute yeah. before Shabbos? Yeah. Or is it in the person the whole time? So the answer is actually both of them. It's really the root soul, a person just becomes more open to it, more aware, more, it's more conducive. Shabbos is more auspicious to, to contact spiritual matters, and especially one's own root soul. But there's a, there's a Rashimu, as a, an impression of the bigger soul, including the, the divine soul, that is in the contracted soul in the body. That's one of the parables that he brings of how to, how to understand this. Okay, so we'll, we'll just try to put this all together here. That, That Yaakov's realization and revelation is that God is truly everywhere. It's not that God is up there looking down on us and, or even giving us commands in the Torah and we're doing them. But there's this reality of God being all around us, within us, surrounding us, transcendent and imminent at the same time. And this is what Yaakov wakes up to, that God was in this place and I didn't know it. So we should end with a bracha. First of all, we, we should say that we should always see the wonders of the Torah mm -hmm. as, they're, as they're revealed here. And we should experience Yaakov's blessing that it should be as easy for us to hold on to all the various Israel as as sleeping in, in a place and having it, the whole land folded up under him. But we should always uh, have the blessing that Yaakov had is of God appearing to him and saying, I'll take care of you. Everything's going to be okay. I'm with you. And Yaakov went through lots of hard, 
hard times. God, did, the famous thing, God didn't promise him a rose garden, mm -hmm. but He did promise, "I'll be with you." Mm -hmm. That's that's really a bracha because, for what, for whatever reasons, this, this world is not a rose garden. Mm -hmm. But if, when we realize that God is with us, it makes things much much easier to deal with. So we should all have that bracha. Thank mm -hmm. you.